Hello and um, welcome along. It's Andy, um, your host on this here podcast. Hello, dear listener, and uh, welcome. It's episode 16. This week, the granddaddy of the uh, Asian wedding videography and photography market, Mr. Tajinder Singh, who I think everybody knows, everybody's worked for at some point, and... uh, (laughs) um, but I wanted to go a bit deeper than just the videography business. So please uh, enjoy this chat with Tej. And we cover everything from, I think, about 1980-something right through to today. Um, yeah, let's have a listen. Tej Singh. So here we are, uh, episode 15. Episode 16 of the episode professionals podcast. 16 um, big thanks to atoll because he's provided the venue for today's recording and if you can hear crunching and slurping going on in the background that's my guest uh, eating his roasted and salted jumbo cashews and a very nice cup of tea supplied by ixl center so and my guest today is the one and only mr tajinder singh welcome welcome andy Thank you very much for doing this, and, and I know I say this on every episode, but we actually have had all on fun trying to arrange the uh, the time and the place and the venue to do it. So um, now you're famously uh, Punjab 2000, uh, but that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about with you is because you've been how many years have you been in the business? Oh cracky, Andy, I can't even remember now. Come on. Oh God. Uh, well, Punjab 2000 started in 2000. 2000. Obviously. Bit of a giveaway for um, the name. So um, the wedding arm started probably about, uh, accidentally, about four or five years later. Okay. Yeah, and that was an accidental thing. Uh, so why did you set up Punjab 2000 in the first place? Oh, that's another long story. Um, I'm obviously an immigrant to the country. By the way, Andy, you never okay. knew that, did no, you? No, I have no clue. No clue. Where from? Yeah, so I came from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. Born in Kenya. I've shot there. Love it. Uh, so yeah, oh, it's an amazing country. Isn't so, it just? Yeah, I landed here back in 1985. Did my education here. Okay. And then I got married here. Okay. And basically that was it. So I became a resident uh, citizen of uh, Britain. Okay. Um Right, so you did your education here, you got married here, uh, you became a citizen here. Um, tell me a little bit more about actually entering the UK, though. What, what age were you when you when you arrived? Um, so I must have been, oh God, now Andy, that's going to be, you're going to calculate my age now. <laughs> uh, that's something else we need to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you're not as old as me, but sorry. Or nearly. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I was around about, what What was I, 19? 19, okay. 19, yes, I would have been 19 then. Okay. And what was your first sort of employment then in the UK? Because it, obviously it wasn't media and stuff, I'm oh, guessing. Oh, crikey, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's taking me back in the days of uh, Oliver Timpson. Uh, where, where else operative hours? I was offloading lorries, my friend. Oh, okay. Yeah, shoe lorries and shoe boxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, My aim was actually to get into the uh, computer room. Right. So the only way into that quickly was to get employment in the company somehow. So I managed to secure this job, offloading, da-da-da. I worked there for about three months. It was the hardest three months I've ever done, honestly, (laughs) Andy. Yeah, it was hard. Um, Physical labor. Physical labor. uh, You're offloading lorries outside in the rain, the cold, the snow, everything. Okay. So it was not easy. Okay. Um, there have been some of the employees there that have been working there for years. Yeah. I couldn't think, oh my God, how have you guys been doing this? And also because they've got no ambition to get any further, but you did have ambition. I, 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 I don't know. It's personal circumstances, whereas myself, that was my aim. That's where I needed to go. Okay. Uh, so Because I'd done computer operations. So I was a computer, I was trained in computer programming and all that. So okay. My idea was, how do I get into a programming job? Right. So let's, I thought, okay, this company does, uh, they did uh, COBOL programming. Uh, they had uh, COBOL systems in place. Right. So I thought, okay, that's the way to go. So I become a, in the warehouse, I moved up to being a punch operator. Okay. So I used to punch all the data into the systems and then slowly went into the computer room, into the computer operations. So you're just like slowly crawling yeah. away up the ladder. 
Uh, and part of it was, I faced a lot of racism, by the way, Andy. Oh, my God. Well, let's come back to that. That was, in, in fact, those no, days. let's examine it, that now. Come it on, was, It was horrible. It was terrible. Really? Uh, at times, I used to feel quite lonely on my own. So how um, many other Asian immigrants were there working around you? I mean, They weren't that many, Andy. Presumably, 1980-something. No. Yeah, they weren't that many. Um, not Asians. Um it used to be a lot of, obviously a lot of uh, whites there, yeah. and uh, in terms of blacks, they were mainly on the lowly paid jobs in those yeah. days, and uh, definitely horrible. And I had lots of friends there as well, yeah. but none of them would actually step up to these guys who would come in and racially try to target me. Yeah, uh, but it's grim. You know, it? it's one of those things uh, you stand up to that. And but that's some years after uh, Idi Amin and Uganda nations oh, yeah. arriving in the UK. Yeah. So even at that point in the 80s, you're still suffering from racial abuse. And you still have it to this day. It's grim. But going back to those days, it was hard. Yeah. It was hard. I eventually managed to get out of that. We had lots of fights and, you know, the... Um, managers at that point, they weren't really on your side. No. They would just turn a blind eye. They would just look the other side and yeah, yeah. let it carry on. Let you deal with it. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we used to have lots of slag- being, slagging matches. <laughs> take, taken as being banter, I'm, I'm assuming. It's just a term of banter. Yeah, there was nothing physical. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely yeah, verbal abuse and all that you'd get. So, following Timpsons, where did you move to from there? Well, um, funnily enough, my wife uh, spotted this... Uh, Hang on, you've not got married yet in the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, later on, um, uh, in terms of... Uh, I was obviously moving along in terms of uh, working at uh, Oliver Timpsons. I was there for yeah. about a year. And then uh, eventually I got engaged and everything. And that's yeah. when my wife spotted this uh, job opportunity. Okay. Uh, and she goes, oh, there's a job opportunity here. This is, uh, I think, about three years after I was at Oliver Timpson, I moved to Benson Shoe okay. as a computer operator. Right. And that was another company I'd targeted because they did COBOL systems. Yeah. So my previous experience at Oliver Timpson and Shoe Company meant I was able to go into Benson Shoe. Okay. And that's where I got most of my programming uh, and operations experience. And then that is after that is when I was able to move over to the county, Leicester County Council. Okay. Because uh, they had a job op- uh, opening that my wife spotted. Oh, okay. And she goes, Ted, why don't you apply for this? Okay. So I applied and I uh, got in. Um, Just I mean, I started off with, what, £90 a week <laughs> in those days, back yeah, in then? Yeah. Uh, and um, with the council, uh, there was much improvement in terms of wages and everything. Yeah. Uh, what about the racism, though? Did that still carry on along, um, along the similar lines? It, it slowly started changing because of uh, my position then. So I was now a computer operator, well-liked, actually, at in uh, Oliver Timpson and obviously at uh, Benson Chu. Mm. Um, because I used to get up really early in the morning during my shifts. Uh, things like three o'clock. Oh, I'm supposed to be there for five. So I wake up at three, I'd get in for four, and we'd get all the data downloaded from there. I used to have about 350 branches all over the UK. So you were Mr. Productive. Okay. I was getting in there. The, the only reason was I could leave early. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, doing a shift on a Sunday. <laughs> so so yeah. when you got married then, uh, I'm, imagining, I'm imagining the landscape of photo video was... Uh, completely different to how it is now there was um, um, i mean we have multi- teams of multiple people filming uh, you have teams of photographers teams of videographers you have sliders you have cranes you have this you have that how much of that was present when you got married what what was your wedding video oh crikey yeah in terms of my wedding uh, we didn't even have a reception okay uh no um because the family i got married to this aside um they want the dad. He didn't want receptions and stuff like that. They just wanted a gurdwara wedding, and that was okay. it. Okay. They we did have pre weddings, and in fact, we shared those pre weddings. Okay. Um, and no, I mean uh, the my uncle, Mrs. Side, he done the video. I had a videographer from our side. Yeah. A uh, friend who did that, and it was just you know shoulder mount, huge big cameras with cables and everything. Mm. So in those days, it wasn't fancy wedding halls. 
Um, and even in terms of the number of goodware available to you to get married in, I'm imagining it is probably nowhere near the number that we've got today. That's correct. I mean, I got married at the Romgaria Gurdwara in Leicester. Yeah. So that's one of the oldest ones, and which they've now moved to a new one um, over in Hamilton. So that transition was quite big, and I filmed that as well, you know, okay. in terms of the, the size of the Gurdwara. Yeah. Uh, what we used to have and what we have now, because the community has grown, so we now have larger Gurdwaras that now cater for just about everything, you know, your parking spaces, yeah. your education facilities. So it's been a big leap in terms of the Gurdwara facilities for yeah. the community. You were sort of saying there was no reception, but you did have pre, pre-parties and things. Um, were they covered for photo and video or were they just sort of celebrations? Yeah, I mean, the coverage was like minimal in those days. They were what, sorry? Uh, very minimalistic oh, yeah, in terms okay. of uh, <clears throat> the photos, the video. There would only be one person covering yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, so you know, Imagine I, that today. <laughs> be, you could still do it. Yeah. But it'd be very difficult. Well, Mandy, uh, Mandy yeah. Dillon gets close to it, I think, doesn't she? <laughs> With one-person coverage. Well, I'm actually editing... I edited uh, one of the videos that she did for me. Okay. And she had, like, about three cameras. Yeah, I know. She's <laughs> nice just... and steady. <clears throat> and in fact, um, the way her data was laid out... Yeah. ...on the folders and everything... Yeah was really neat and tidy. I've got to give it to Mandy. I mean, that was really tidy. You know, yeah. camera one would be a uh, red one, blue one. And it's, uh, I think, uh, going back to what Vince used to do. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about that later, about Vince and everything. Uh, but, yeah, in terms of um, the Gurdwara side. Yeah. Um, and weddings. They used to be smaller weddings in terms of um, the venues. Yeah. I guess numbers. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then they started growing bigger slowly because weddings moved into wedding halls. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Instead of small venues, they started using the school halls. Uh, okay. So that's when things started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And the music uh, in those days was like amazing. Uh, and majority of that singing used to be community singing. The ladies would sing. So on your pre-wedding parties, all the ladies were singing. Well, this is... Because occasionally women do break into song, particularly at Milner's, women yeah. will just break into song. And it's kind of, it's all not half-hearted, but not many people join in as well at the same time. So is that a throwback to those sort of days? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, but that's, again, that's changing because uh, that's the old generation. And majority of that old generation has now obviously passed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, even here in Leicester, um, we used to have the satsang, yeah, we used to call them the Lady Sangi. They used to do uh, lots of uh, singing of hymns at the Gurdwara. Uh, and I think from that group, there's only a few ladies left. Really? And majority of the previous uh, ladies, they all sang at my wedding. Okay. And it was amazing. I can imagine. Just just amazing. Yeah. Um Imagine the pre-wedding being in your front room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what used to happen. Okay. So uh, they used to all just gather into the living rooms and the garages and everything, and yeah. everything just used to happen in the house in those days. And presumably because the community has grown over the years, over the intervening years, that's, that's another <coughs> contributory factor, I guess, to why we've got the big fat Indian weddings that we have today. Yes, it's not only that. It's uh, uh, people have now got uh, bigger businesses. There's a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, people can afford to buy bigger houses. Yeah. You know, bigger places, and they can also afford to spend more money on uh, things uh, that they missed out. So they're spending that on their children. You know. Understood. Um, and it's a nice thing to do if yeah, you can afford it. So yeah. do it. Yeah. Uh, that's not saying everyone should do it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, try and live within your means and try and yeah. do that. Do whatever you can for your yeah. children. Yeah, yeah. Um, just rewinding then back to um, back to your job with the council. Where did you go from from there then? So you're you're now married. Uh, children at that point? Um, no, my uh, we actually waited. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, we waited for about five years because. 
um, we'd go into yeah. basically financial reasons. Yeah. Uh, I just come across from you know, from Kenya. I didn't really have a lot of money, and I didn't really want the pressures of uh, you know bringing up a new family. Yeah. Because we didn't even have a house by then. Okay. So um, we finally bought a house uh, through my father-in-law who had a garage in Leicester. And next door there's this lady that was selling her house. And she gave it uh, basically... Uh, cut price. <laughs> cut price. Uh, <laughs> she knew the family and she was very happy to see that someone else that she knew. Yeah. That, and the daughter would be moving into the house. So she was a really kind lady. and Excellent. It gave us a house, and so that's how things moved. Uh, so once we had uh, bought the house, then we thought, okay, right, it's now time to start a family. Yeah. And in fact, that actually leads me to the video side. Okay. Because when my daughter was born, Taranjit, um, I went to the hospital and I took some pictures on a poxy little camera. Yeah. And I had them developed, and I thought, oh my God, what is this? It was so rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I was <clears throat> I was working at the council then, and so I had a little bit of money. Yeah, and I went off and bought myself a Canon video camera. Okay, um, I think it was, was it a half inch CCD then or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, on <clears throat> tape. Um, yes, that's, that's <clears throat> not somebody breaking wind. That's some construction work going on. <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> supposed to be the quiet room. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we'll get through it. Don't worry. So yeah, so. Um, so I bought the video camera, it's a Canon one, fantastic camera it was, and um, took some uh, video of my daughter in hospital, and that's where things started moving along in terms of video. So that sort of piqued your interest in, in video and photo and, and just... Yeah, I mean, in terms of photo, I already had that, because going back to now Kenya, Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> in my younger days, um, I think it was back in probably the... Oh, it probably must be the 75, 1975, something like that, or probably yeah. some roundabout there, where friends of my f uh, dad, they wanted to come over to the UK. Right. So this is kind of near roundabout the Exodus period. And um, they didn't have enough money to buy the tickets to come across to the UK. So they had permission, they had the visas and everything sorted, and they wanted to come over here. So it goes to my dad. Have you got some money you can lend us? Uh, I think they needed something like 30, 40,000 Kenya shillings mm -hmm. to make up. And dad goes, Yeah, I, I'll lend you that and you can pay me back later. And they goes, Well, we've got this kit. Because they were into uh, photography and everything in those days. Okay. And they goes to dad, Here's a box. It was a, a Minolta box. Yeah. Uh, with all the Minolta cameras, the lenses, everything. Really? I think it was worth about 50,000 shillings then. Yeah. So he goes to dad, you have this. He goes, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they goes, your son could use that. And that was it. My dad kept it and I started using that camera. Uh, just breaking in, usual thing. Halftime um, interruption from me just to ask. And a few of you are now, so I'm grateful for that. Thank you. But if you are listening and enjoying what you're listening to, then please spread the word. Um, not just in the Asian market, but far and wide. Um, I think everyone's got an interesting story to tell, and uh, I want to get those stories out there. So please share the Wedding Professionals podcast on all social media channels. It's available on every podcast platform you can mention. Um, so yeah, send it out there. Let's get people listening. Thank you very much. Let's get back to Tej. <laughs> Uh, in so, terms you, of so you had there was, there's always been that little interest in in yes. Imagery. So when we used to go for picnics or day outs, I would use that. We used to have the Kenya Safari Rally back in those days, right? Yeah. And uh, my dad used to take us out for okay. that. So I used to use that camera to take some photos. I don't know where those photos are I was now. just going to say. <laughs> I really don't know. Because uh, I immigrated this way, and I think a lot of the stuff was left behind and nothing came what across. What a shame. Yes, I will ask Dad. Uh, my uncle still has some of the photos, though. so one day I'll get those. But yeah, that's yeah. where my my photo interest started. Yeah, back in the day. So imagine, you know, 
taking photos with a Minolta manual camera, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and on film, not digital. Yeah, it was on not, film. Yeah, so yeah. you don't know what you've got until it's developed. That's right. You'd be standing around corners and the cars would be zooming by and, yeah. you know, you'd time it to make sure you got that, that camera that first ready and click. Yeah. <laughs> So now we're fast forwarding to, uh, well, was there anything in between the sort of, so we got up to the, probably the late 80s, I think. Is it, what, What's there in between the late 80s and Punjab 2000 in, in 2000? Um, I don't think there was anything happening apart from, um, I still had a keen interest in uh, Bangra music or yeah. music in general, yeah. guzzles. You know, I used to listen to a lot of Jigjeet back in the day. Um, so I used to love that, and then when I moved here, uh, my missus was into Bangra music. Yeah, and uh, I can't dance. I've got two left feet. <laughs> Me neither. I didn't even have a dance at my own wedding, so I don't have uh, any sympathy for that. She got me into this uh, dance group that she was already in, and they were missing out a partner. Uh, uh, and Hang on, goes, so you, you took up dance? And just for that occasion. <laughs> <laughs> so she taught me how to dance, and um, I just carried on with the Bangra music, listened to it, I loved it. Because I used to listen to a lot of R&B because of my cousins. Yeah. So R&B was with us. That was, yeah, okay. That was it. You know, we used to play R&B on uh, albums, records and stuff, and really loud in the house. So is that a clue then to where Punjab 2000 started? Because I know you've got a huge interest in, in live music and live music events. You're always out covering yeah. this and that. So did that, is that where the genesis of that started? Yes, definitely. I mean, slowly we've migrated into um, going to events, yeah, listening to music there. And I think Punjab 2000 was more about selling music. Because uh, I used to visit Tony's shop here in Leicester, uh, yeah. Friends Electric. Now, this uh, uh, Tony was your business partner. Yes. So initially, obviously, he was just a you know he was just a shopkeeper that I knew. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was a good, great shopkeeper that you know everyone used to go down to. Yeah. Uh, listen to the music. He would just take out a tape. Okay. Play you the music. Do you want to listen to it? He would uh, open the CDs and the tapes yeah make sure you've listened to it before you buy it okay so he slowly developed a kind of uh feel for what i used to like yeah so sometimes you just put five tapes away from me and say here we go this yeah. is what you're having this week <laughs> <laughs> and that was it okay. uh i thought tony why what about selling these online yeah and that's what i was thinking about online back in those days okay because I, I had already set up a kind of a message board, which was the Punjab 2000 message board. So that was happening in the background. And then okay. we thought, okay, right. Using that, we can now sell this music. So that's when Tony used to give me these CDs and uh, tapes um, that I would take home. I would punch in the information onto the system, um, type all that in. It was hard work. Yeah. Um, and then by that time, my dad had come across. Um, so dad, mum and dad had packed away uh, from Kenya and they were now thinking, okay, you guys have moved across that way. Yeah. You know? uh, mum, my mum was already a British citizen, so she was able to bring dad here that way, no problems. Yeah. And he came here and he thought, mm, I was a headmaster over there. What am I going to do here? Because <laughs> <laughs> okay. my dad runs school. He had uh, two schools in Kenya. Okay. Uh, and then he thought, right, okay, there's no point of us staying here if you guys are over there. Sure. Uh, so my brother had already moved here, my sister, so we were all here. Yeah. So they joined us as well. And I uh, thought, okay, right, Dad, you're going to be typing all this information in instead <laughs> of me. <laughs> so, and that's where Punjab 2000 actually started then. Uh, he was able to enter all that information into the system, and we were able to start selling these CDs on an online catalogue. So we were selling to across the world. So this uh, this is an aspect that I had no idea about yeah. at all. Yeah, so we were selling quite a lot of yeah. albums, CDs, 
Which, tapes. Which also gives you an in, if you like, with the artists themselves as well, because they exactly. can see that you're They selling. used to, well, majority of the artists actually used to come to the shop to do their album launches and stuff. Yeah, okay. So that's where the connection between Punjab 2000, the artists, and Tony Pabla, Friends Electric, all connected. And this is UK Bangra artists? Or UK worldwide? Bangra. Majority was UK Bangra artists. Yeah. Um, in, in, in terms of the actual... Uh, Punjab 2000 message board, we were actually, I think, we were Facebook before Facebook. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, Bangra music. If only you'd sold that idea a bit further on, eh? Well, we were, <laughs> never, we were never sort of interested in the money side of it. It was more about the, passion. the culture, the passion. Yeah. Um, by the way, many marriages have been made on Punjab 2000 message board. Many have been broken. <laughs> Um, I laugh about it. I mean, some people have taken it quite seriously yeah. uh, because it's affected them uh, in ways that even we didn't imagine. And it's only later on we found out, oh, hang on a minute, X, Y, Z. You know, nowadays what you find on social media is you get this uh, bullying and stuff and people just call each other names and uh, derogatory comments and all that happened. That yeah. used to happen on the Punjab 2000 message board. And unfortunately, we couldn't police it enough yeah. because it was huge. We were all we all had full time jobs, and then we had this thing happening in the background, and then we got people there late at night in the middle of the morning, putting up messages that we weren't aware of. Yeah. So by the time X Y Z had found out something had been written about him, that message has already gone down the timeline. So mm. we don't know what's happened. Mm. Um, Human nature is a funny thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's unfortunately, uh, and I apologise to everyone that might listen to this and find, oh, this happened to me on the message board. We're sorry. Just, just not uh, enough. It, it, we just couldn't handle it. Yeah, it was something that was there. Yeah, uh, and you just had to either report it back to us, and we'd deal with it, or if it, it wasn't went, reported, it just. Went, I mean, we did have some administrators, but again. They weren't able to handle it either. Yeah. You know, yeah. But it was very good in terms of um, advertising music, talking about music. Yeah. Uh, and if you think about it, the podcast, it's it's like the podcast that you're now doing. Yeah. Uh, but on the message board, it's all written. Yes. And people can write anything. Yeah. And we used to have loads of keyboard warriors. Just it astonishes me. Yeah, it's uh, definitely the keyboard warriors, and they have a lot of time on their hands. Yeah, too much time on their hands. It's just just mental. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about Tony then, uh, because Tony, I know, became then a huge, huge part of your life, didn't he? Amazing fellow, Tony was. Um, he had a great heart. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so going back to the shop days, uh, we slowly became friends, basically. Yeah. And that's the name of the shop. Yeah. <laughs> and he was basically friends with anyone. He didn't have a bad word to say about anyone. Very pleasant chap. And he would spend ages on the phone, ages talking to his customers. And his mom would always tell me, tell, tell him, he's got a business to run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's not making enough money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he should be spending more time making the money instead of spending time talking on the phone. <laughs> he was forever on the phone. I mean, he would spend hours. Even if I was, he was ringing me, he would be an hour on the phone to me. Okay. It's just crazy. Yeah. Very lovely chap. His knowledge of music was amazing. Okay. Um, have, you, have you got anywhere near his level of nope, knowledge? Nope. No. Nope. He used to know the CDs, the albums, the sleeve covers, the, yeah. uh, the tracks that are on there. Yeah. Uh, who played what. Uh, he had all that knowledge. Yeah. Um, and that was just purely sort of uh, Bangra music then, not, not in, nothing English or American or... In, in the shop, it was all Bangra, Asian music, Bollywood yeah. music, uh, guzzles. Uh, it was a whole range of uh, yeah. genre that he had. Uh, not mainstream English music. No. But... He was also into R and B, like myself, and okay. into English music and gigs, and we used to go to those so festivals. Yeah, he was out there. The carnivals. Yeah, he was all. I can't, I can't imagine you at a carnival. So <laughs> 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 it's just oh. well, the, how the years treat us badly, don't they? Um, so. Uh, so stepping on very slightly then, Punjab 2000, the message board, everything's happening, you're selling music, artists, you know all the artists, 
So when do you start morphing into uh, taking photographs at concerts and video at concerts? Yeah, that basically started with the uh, the gigs uh, with Punjab 2000. So um, I spotted that uh, at the shop there used to be lots of gig flyers. Yeah. Uh, any gig happening, they'll drop the flyers with Tony. And was there was there a, sorry to interrupt, but was there a very healthy gig scene at that oh, time? Oh yes, because Bangra music was had taken off. And it was round about that time when he was really taking off. Okay. In terms of the gig scene. Yeah. Uh, a lot was happening. Yeah. Um, the wedding scene was taking off. Yeah. And people wanted live music. So okay. you've got the banger artists and yeah. live music and they're just taking off from there. Yeah. We used to have the daytimers. I mean, those were the days. <laughs> what, all day parties or...? Well, not all day. They used to be in the afternoons normally. Okay. So that's when the the students and so on were able to get to wherever. So we used to have uh, daytimers in London, daytimers in the in Leicester, Birmingham, and everywhere. And this is where the gig scene was really kicking off. Okay. Because students obviously are supposed to be in school. Yeah. Or studying. in colleges and yes. studying. But oh no. <laughs> <laughs> we were parting away. Um so yeah, those were great days in terms of uh, Bangra music yeah. uh, and the live scene, the gig scene. Yeah, And you see some of that coming back uh, in terms of we've got the old school Bangra gigs that have started happening now in, in, in Birmingham and in Leicester as well, London as well, is to try and revive that music. Hmm. And uh, the old Bangra music is what you call the evergreen music. Hmm. I mean, it's also like the, you've got Bollywood music, which is evergreen. You can listen to it today and it still sounds so still relevant current, and yeah. so good Yeah. in terms of the music, the composition. It's just perfect. It, it, I mean, I'm, I, I love when somebody like Jas Johal, yeah. he does like half an hour of old school. And they're, they're the bits that I really, really love. because They're I, really pumping, aren't they? To, yeah, yeah. They, they, they and, the way, and then what you can do with that is you can have one song playing and you can mix the next one. It just, it just flows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's just amazing. And, and the thing with that is it's music that you can not only just dance to, you sing along to it. Yeah. Well, you can. I can yeah. And it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> not me. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic. I mean, uh, Bangra music, uh, it's folk music. Yeah. And it talks about the culture and there's a lot of humor in it. There's lots of things they say in the music. Yeah, the words, the lyrics, and everything is just amazing. Yeah, yeah. and somebody, uh, somebody like uh, Malkit Singh then is probably a throwback to. I mean, where where was he in the eighties? Uh, again, so he's in the Bangra scene then. Yeah, so he's already there. there yeah. I mean, there, a lot of the artists were established then. Do you know Push? Yes. Push, I didn't know was a tabla player back in the day oh, okay. with the Shan group. Okay, <laughs> right. He was only with me yesterday, and we were just talking about this. And he goes, Tej, you know, I was trained. I goes, who are you trained by? He goes, by Gurshan Mal. Wow. <laughs> oh, well, I never have this thought of that. Thing. People hide their light under a bushel, <laughs> yeah. don't they? It's, he goes, it's, not many people know that. Yeah. He goes, uh, I got trained they by do him. They now. And he goes, uh, I also learned tabla off Tubsi. Okay. I thought, what? He goes, yeah, Tubsy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in those days, the, the Bangra scene was, um, I mean, in terms of um, the artists uh, as well as the uh, musicians, yeah. it's very close. Yeah. Everybody knew everyone. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then was there, just carrying on with the Bangra thing, because obviously, I mean, I've been doing Asian events for probably 12, 15 years. Uh, and mostly, I would say in the early days, it was just a DJ and big PAs and, you know, recorded music. Um, but I've noticed a resurgence in live acts um, starting to appear again. Like Malkit, for instance, I filmed him so many times. Um, uh, and there's, I think there's been a real resurgence and it's really nice to see live bands coming back at weddings and, and so on and so forth. So is there, was there a, a, this is a very long-winded way of asking, did Bangra music tail off for a bit and now it's coming back or? Yes, that, that is definitely correct because obviously um, it's a generational thing, isn't it? Yeah. So in those days, that generation loved the live scene. Mm. Um, then you have the younger generation. 
they were now into their English Western music and so on. So that's changed. So then you have that drop in in, in that. I think that's mm-hmm. what happened. Uh, also, I suppose, uh, in terms of the quality of music that was coming out, was maybe not the kind of music that the younger generation wanted to listen to. Sure. So that changed. But now what you have is the younger generation producing music that their friend circle and uh, people of their age want to listen to. Yeah. But does it, it has its roots, though, going back to... Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes. So majority of the uh, sort of artists, the younger artists, will have listened to music from uh, current Bhangra artists. Yeah. You know, majority of them have. And they'll say that was uh, their inspiration. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I suppose it's like Oasis citing the Beatles as their Exactly. Inspir- yeah, 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 very, very similar sort uh, of thing. And that's how it happens. Fantastic. Um, so we've still not yet got to the point where you wake up one morning and decide that you're going to film weddings for a living. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, um, well, I was uh, filming, uh, well, I had the video camera yep. uh, for my daughter, so I was filming family videos and stuff yeah uh and then uh what happened uh, i went to the gurdwara this is leicester's gurdwara uh, holy bones we call it but it's called the gurnana gurdwara that's the official name okay and um i love listening to the kirtan yeah i thought okay i'll record this so i recorded one sunday i went there i put my camera and recorded that and uh, i think it was um was it Daljit Neer or one of the TV station guys saw me recording that? And they says, can we have the footage? And that's where it kicked off. So I started recording every Sunday uh, at, uh, at Gurnana Gurdwara yeah. for the TV. And um, the, the Gurdwara and a number of other Gurdwaras got together and they would sponsor this program on TV. Oh, okay. So I actually got paid, by the way, okay. to do this. This is a refreshing change. So it wasn't a lot of money, but it was just covering my expenses. Uh, my time expenses and so on. So sure. it was okay. And I loved it. And that's how I got into like videoing and video skills and so on. Uh, and then um, I used to see a lot of other videographers come to the Gurdwara for the weddings and film and so on. Ah, right. Yeah. And I thought, oh, God, that's a lot of hard work. Isn't it? This is great. I just do this and <laughs> off I go. And then um, I think I slowly got to know uh, this guy um, who became a very close friend and uh, I think one of the best uh, portrait family Punjabi photographers in Leicester ever I've seen. His name was Kushpal Singh Burmi. He used to come, I think, nearly every other weekend. They used to have weddings there, and he used to come with uh, a lad called uh, Johnny. Uh, and they used to film, and they used to photograph, and uh, they would come in round about the time my session would be starting. So yeah. I'd always bump into them, so I got to know them and so on. And then uh, after, uh, I think, about uh, maybe a few months, uh, Johnny passed away. Um, Johnny was a videographer yeah. that we used to work with, Burmi. And then uh, Kushfal Burmi had a wedding coming up. And he goes, Tej, do you think you could do this wedding? I thought, I've never done a wedding before. <laughs> <laughs> Quite terrifying, I would uh, imagine. Yeah, so um, he goes, well, I'll be with you and we'll do it together. He goes, it's nothing major. So that's where I moved into weddings. And Just like that. I haven't looked back, really. No. Uh, How many... So what year was that, do you think? That would have been around about 2002, 2003, probably. Okay. Yeah, around about then. So we're on about your 20th anniversary of, of um, weddings then. Yeah, so, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. Um, yeah, quite enjoyed that. I mean... But once I moved into that with Kushpal, it was just amazing. It was just another thing. Yeah. We still used to have, we didn't have uh, big batteries or anything. So we had these training cables yeah, you have to plug for the lights yeah. and everything. It was, it was mad. Yeah. It's something I didn't like doing, but I ended up doing it. And what yeah. about the editing? After you'd filmed, did he carry on with the editing or was it down to you to do that? 
Oh no, uh, basically he would. He, his job was the photography side. He okay. would take care of that, and the video side became mine. I, yeah. I just did the video side. But then, with your knowledge, your computing knowledge, probably you were ahead of the game. Slightly. I was, yes, at uh, that time. Uh, I mean, in terms of software, I had some really basic software. Yeah. That used to just do cut to cut editing, and that was it. That's all I needed for TV. So yeah. I just carried on using that for yeah. for video and. It, yeah, I carried on using that for a long time. I think uh, then we used to bump into other videographers because in those days, the bride side would have their team and the groom side would have their team and you'd have a clash. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I learned from Kushval, uh, Kush as we used to call him. Yeah. Uh, Kush as in happy. <laughs> yeah. He would all be happy. Uh, amazing chap he was. And... Um, he goes, Ted, let's go and just say hi to them. Let's shake their hands. And if we yeah. get on, we get on. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I really don't want to. He goes, come <laughs> on. I goes, they look evil. <laughs> I go, I don't think they like us already. <laughs> and I look at them standing there. They're looking at us, giving us the evil look. Yeah. Uh, the opposition party. Uh, but yeah, he trained me into that. He goes, look, let's be friendly. Let's shake hands. Let's let's do it. Yeah. And uh, he goes, if they then you know don't want to work with us, then fine, we'll just do our thing. And it was at about this point that I thought, do you know what? This is going on longer than a normal record, and maybe we'll get two episodes out of this. And sure enough, when I came to sit down and edit, uh, the amount of material that we got with Tej was phenomenal. So um, I'm going to curtail it here for this one. Um, join me next week when we get to the second half of the fascinating chat with Ted Singh. Thanks very much. See you next week. Bye-bye.